Funding for this program is provided by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Hello, I'm Chef John Foles, welcoming you to this great state of ours. We're real proud of our people, places, and food, and I'd like for you to know a little bit more about it. So join me and some of my friends as we visit the historical food towns of this state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Everybody and welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, and boy, am I happy you stopped by the kitchen today as we continue to search out the historical food towns of Louisiana. Today, we're going over to the eastern part of our state to the parish of Caldwell, Tinsaw, and Concordia, and we're going to visit the towns of Waterproof and Faraday. We'll even stop by the little town of Columbia, where one of our governors, Governor John McKithen, lives and he's the one who actually was responsible for the Superdome. Here we're at the Louisiana Folklife Museum, and this little museum is a community project headed by Mrs. Hazel Daly and a lot of her good buddies who come to the museum every day. What a great place this is to visit. All of the artifacts from years gone by are on display here, but one of the greatest things is that every day there's demonstrations going on, not only cooking demonstrations, but people can come in and watch cake making, but hey, butter making. This lady right here is actually gonna show a group how to make butter by sitting and churning it, and once it's all done, she's gonna use that old wooden paddle that has grooves just cut into it to squeeze out all of that excess buttermilk from the butter, and look how nice and yellow and creamy this is. What an art that's been gone for so many years. The day I was there, we were even making live soap to show people how we used to wash clothes many, many years ago. This old wash tub with the board you can see there, scrubbing it and then running it through this uh, old wheel. You know, imagine people complaining about wash day today. A lot of times farmers will just stop by and drop off produce and the ladies will do some really nice canning. I've never seen more vivid colors in a jar in my entire life than right here in Colombia, They don't actually sell these, but they do sell a little bit of uh, jams and jellies as people come through. But more importantly, just a lot of great, great things happening. This is the Mississippi River at Natchez coming back into Louisiana. We're heading to Waterproof. We're going to Midway Plantation. That's Nan Huff right over to the left. And Nan opened Midway Plantation, which is a little canning plant, oh, in about the early 1980s. And Nan will can about six to seven tons of wild fruit and berries from the Louisiana swamplands and prairies every year. And Nan was telling me that she ships these berries all over the United States uh, to specialty stores, even to Alaska. She has stores in Alaska that just wait patiently for those great Louisiana berries every year. She was showing me how to make a great, great strawberry jam. This is some of her pepper jellies and she actually cans about 12 different types of fruits and jams each year. And look how nice and country this looks, and little bags of different kind of candies. And her husband actually does popcorn rice, and popcorn rice is one of the flavored rice of Louisiana that we use. Ah, boy, I tell you, look at this, pecans. Imagine walking up to a pecan tree right in waterproof Louisiana and pulling off some of these great soft-shell pecans. I'm going to tell you, this, this variety is called Desirable. And after I peeled it and put the thing in my mouth, I knew exactly where the name came from. Carol Lee and Buddy Miller runs Plantation Pecan Company, and they harvest about 200 tons of fresh pecans every year right there in Waterproof and ships them all over the country. They also make pralines and pecan candies and they, in that little plant they have there, they make so many great pecan dishes that I spent one day just walking around. They even smoke hams with pecan wood to ship across the United States. Wonderful little towns right there. 
and coming to visit with me in the kitchen just a little bit later is a good friend of mine who lives right down the street from Waterproof, and Penny Gregg, believe it or not, is an ostrich farmer. And she's from right there in, um, in Faraday, Louisiana. I'm trying to think of the name of those little bitty towns as we go down the highway, but Penny has a great ostrich farm, and boy, does she have some stories to tell about that. So I want you to sit right there uh, and wait for Penny. One of the dishes that I want to do for you today is from Waterproof. The dish is pecan crusted breast of chicken. You saw those beautiful pecans and chicken is something that you have every day on a menu all over the United States. So I wanted to share with you one of the great recipes. If you look down into my bowl here, you're gonna see that I've got some pecans that have been pretty much crushed or just cracked kind of coarsely. And then I have some flour and I'm gonna mix the two of them together. Now pecans is something that we have been breading fish chicken, meats in Louisiana for a long, long time because we are always looking for that great nutty flavor when we saute or pan fry a dish that's been breaded. And pecans will give us just that nice flavor. Into this, I'll season it with a little bit cracked pepper and salt. Of course, you can use whatever flavors you would like naturally. I'm gonna put a little thyme and basil into my pecan flour batter, again, stirring that nicely. And in the bowl right here, I've got just a little bit egg wash. Now, this is equal parts of egg, heavy cream, and water, just a standard egg wash. And if you don't like to use cream, well, just stay away from heavy whipping cream and use a little skim milk. That'll be just fine. You don't have to put uh, any salt or pepper in there because obviously there's a lot of seasoning here. Now, I have my nice chicken breasts. They're all deboned, and of course, you can see how nice and light this is. And I'm gonna use one hand to put it down into the egg wash. Just an old trick I learned. And then I'll use the other hand to actually bread it in the pecan crust. That'll keep all that egg uh, wash and flour from sticking to your fingers and make things just a little easier to work with. And then down into my saute pan. In my saute pan, I already have two pieces of chicken sauteing nicely with the pecan crust. And you don't want to overcook the chicken. You want to put it into this oil. This is just a nice vegetable oil. And you want to kind of cook it for about two to three minutes on each side. That's it until it gets nice and golden brown. Keep it moist on the inside. That's the main thing. Next, I want to make a nice little sauce to go with the pecan crusted chicken. And what kind of sauce would I use? Well, hey, it's going to be obvious. We're going to use a little pecan Pauline sauce. So I'm going to put a little butter down into this, I say butter, buttery flavored oil, any of those kind of nice flavors will work well. Kick my fire up just a little bit. And then I'm gonna add the pecans to it. The pecans will put, again, that nice oil, pecan oil flavor into the butter. And you wanna saute this around for just a second or two. And then you wanna flame it with a little bit praline liqueur. I want you to take a look at this. Praline liqueur, in Louisiana, we actually make a liqueur named Pauline. You could use hazelnut, you could use any of the other nut flavors, but I personally like the uh, Pauline flavor. And I'm gonna add a little bit of that to the skillet. Be careful, because it will flame up, as you can see. And then I'm gonna put a little heavy whipping cream down in there. Whoo, boy, I wish you could smell that great flavor. Now, I'm gonna turn this chicken breast over in the saute pan just like that. You see how nice and light brown that is. Again, you don't want to overcook your chicken. That's the main thing here. Let the cream reduce with the praline flavor. Just swirl that around just a little bit. And I just wish you could smell that great praline flavor coming out of the top of this pan. It's magnificent. I'm going to move this out of the way because I want to pan one of these up for you. And I've got a nice little bowl here. And I'm going to take one of these chicken breasts that's already cooked. I'm gonna put it here. I'm gonna take another one and put it right there. Look at that. And just allow the cream to reduce slightly. It picks up all those great pecan flavors. And I'm gonna put the cream right on top of the chicken. Again, don't stay away from this dish just because you don't want cream. Just go ahead and leave that cream out of there and put skim milk, a little color red bell pepper, orange, and of course, some of this nice purple, right down onto the plate. Isn't that pretty? This is our pecan-crusted chicken from Waterproof, Louisiana, a wonderful dish. 
Now, the next thing I want to do for you is a potato dish right down the street from Waterproof is one of the largest potato farms in the state of Louisiana. And if there's anything we like here, it's potatoes, whether it's yams or white potatoes or whatever. So I'm going to begin by showing you how to do a nice twice-baked potato. So in Cajun country, we'll add andouille, the smoked sausage to it, or tasso, any of those great things. But today, I'm going to make a twice-baked potato using bacon. I'm going to begin by taking one of these bakers and slicing it right down the middle like this. And then once it's sliced, you see how nice and tender this is right on the inside. I'm going to take the meat and put it right into a ricer. You can see that I already have potato that I've scooped right out of the shell right into the ricer here. And I'm going to take the ricer and push the potatoes right into my bowl. You can see I'm going to squeeze this right on through like this, and the potatoes come right out. We can scoop them right off. And of course, this is going to really give a nice, nice, tender, smooth look to the potatoes. You won't have any lumps in the potatoes when you do it this way. So we're going to take the rice potatoes. I've already riced about three or four of them here. And now I'm going to begin to flavor them with that great Louisiana flavor. I'm going to put a little sour cream right down into the dish like this. Smooth that sour cream around into the rice potatoes. And of course, you can put as much as you'd like. I'll add just a little bit more. And then the flavorings. I'm going to put some of the green onions. Of course, you can use chives, green onions, whatever you would like. I'm going to put some bacon, some bacon right down into this. And I'm going to use some tasso. And the tasso is, of course, the Louisiana ham that's been nicely chopped so that we have a really nice smoked flavor in the meat. But again, uh, use smoked sausage or whatever you would like into this. So I'll swirl that around. And then to season it, a little salt, pepper. I'm going to put some of this coarse ground black pepper. I'm going to put a little bit salt. I have to put a little touch of garlic. And then I'll mix all of this in. Again, you just want to put whatever flavors in the twice-baked potato that you like in your own little neighborhood or your own little home. And then some cheddar cheese, sliced cheddar cheese, just like this. And this is going to give the nice creamy cheese flavor to the inside of the potato. Once this is done, you can put it into a pastry bag. I've got a pastry bag here. And if you don't have a pastry bag, you can actually just put it in with a spoon. I'll dump this in, but I'll show you how to put it in here and squeeze it on out. Let me get some of these potatoes that's already sitting here scooped out. And this isn't very hard to do. You just want to go ahead and look at this. Just scoop it right on out like that, pipe it out. You can see the cheese the bacon, the salt, the pepper. Just look how pretty the pastry bag makes it all come out there. Really nice. And you do about three or four of them. You get the general idea. And that's the way the potatoes are done. And once they're all filled, you would bake them in a 350 degree oven for about 10 or 15 minutes just to melt the cheese. You can sprinkle a little cheese on the top. And hey, this is what it's going to look like when they're all done. Take a look at that really nice platter full of Twice baked potatoes from Louisiana. Of course, again, put all of your own flavorings into it. That's the most important thing. Now, I want to show you a couple things that we would serve with this dish. Right here, I have a little squash, yellow and green squash with sauteed pecans right inside the dish. Again, using pecans with vegetables to give a unique flavor. This is summer squash, just sauteed in a little olive oil with green onions and all those great things. And here, I have some strawberry pecan muffins, just really wonderful, all baked with that strawberry pecan flavor once again. So dessert, breads, or vegetables using pecans. OK, I told you that I had a wonderful friend coming to visit with me, Penny Gregg, who's in the ostrich business in Faraday, Louisiana. Hey, Good Penny. Morning, How are you doing? Great to see you. What do you have here? I saw you iron J.R. and Sue Ellen's eggs the other day, so I thought oh, I'd pick man, one look, for you. <laughs> is this gorgeous or what? This is actually an ostrich egg that's been carved out, and then uh, uh, a little bird, a little scene put right on the inside of it. Really, really a wonderful thing. And hey, I saw about five or six of these in your house, and I was about to steal one, so I'm glad you brought me one. This is absolutely beautiful, fantastic. You know, when I was over at your place, we had an opportunity to 
take a couple pictures of some of those great ostriches that y'all raised over there. What an interesting thing. And I want to share some of that with our viewers. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what we're looking at as we take a look at the farm here. Look at this, this bird. Louis. He's a two-year-old male. The, the males are the prettiest ones. They're black with white feathers. The females are a buff color. Um, our pens have a white pipe across the top, top of them around six feet. That is to stop them from running. They can see it day or night. Right into that pipe on the top of the fence. That's right. Well, I tell you, look at the size of this bird. How big is that bird from, from floor to ceiling? How high is that? Goofy is around pushing 10 feet tall and weighing in at about 400 pounds. That is unbelievable. You know, and to think how keen these birds were, most people would think that they were pretty ferocious animal, but actually they're pretty, uh, pretty docile, right? Huh? They're docile in the winter months. Now, when it's time to breed, or they reach around two years old, the breeding age, they become very protective of their pens and their females. They appreciate it if you just leave them alone. But the younger birds are very affectionate and very curious, and they like the attention. That's Goofy and Red over there. And, they, and there we are. I tell you, we had such fun out there. Now, you know, I noticed that in a pen right across was these emus, which, uh, uh, and you told me you always kept emus with the uh, birds. Look at that, that's uh, the ear right on the side. They were pointing out the ear just now. Tell me about those uh, 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 those emus. Were they just just to calm the birds down? No, the, the emu industry is becoming quite popular, too, with a lot of people. Now, we were in the incubator room here. Incubator room. We incubate our eggs in Louisiana because of the humidity. It's better to temperature control and they keep the babies from drowning in their eggs. <laughs> this is the last baby of the hatch, and it's an only child, so he likes a lot of attention. We have a mirror in there so he doesn't realize that he's by himself. He thinks he <laughs> has a friend. That's Porky. Well, look how cute. I, I got down on my hands and knees, and I can get anybody to get out of my hand. Look at this thing. Isn't that something? Just a really beautiful little bitty bird. And to think that I could just sit down there and he would come, he was only about six inches tall, but then he's going to grow to 10 feet high. Yeah. How long would it take him He'll to do that? He'll grow a foot a month until he's about eight or nine months old. And they're very friendly and very docile, but um, once they reach two years old, you never turn your back on them. How long does it take to incubate them? I saw you had this automatic incubator there. Right, we incubate 38 days, and then we move them to the hatcher. And if they're not out by the 42nd day, we go get them. You actually go in and crack them, because look, right. I have one of these ostrich eggs here, and look how Thick. You were showing me the thickness of this shell. Not only the size of it, but the thickness of it. So you actually have to help them get out of here sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes they can get itself. But a 400-pound man can stand on that egg and not break it. Yes. <laughs> well, I, it, it's like China. When it's full. It's almost like China. And these mm -hmm. birds have been around for how many years? Twelve million. Twelve million years. Now I know why. Nobody can eat that. Nothing can eat Nothing the egg. Can get me. Now, did you tell me that there were about two dozen chicken eggs and one right, ostrich 24 egg? 24 to 30 eggs, probably. You can feed a lot of people. Uh, several of the breeders in larger cities are donating these eggs to mission homes and soup kitchens. Is that right? Because they can feed a lot of people. Why, why ostrich farming? You could have done anything in the world, but why in, in Louisiana? Would, how did you get interested in farming We had ostriches? read an article about some people in South Texas and East Texas, and we were just very interested on a, in the inherent value of a bird, the, the hide, the meat, the feathers, and their ability to adapt, and it was a challenge. So uh, do, do you need, uh, uh, now you, you've got some pretty decent acreage out there, but to raise ostriches, I think of the plains of Africa, I think that, because ostriches are originally from the south of Africa, That's right? That's right. Uh, the name of your farm is actually Little Ethiopia. Which That's I, true. Uh, do you need a lot of acreage to no. raise them? Uh, the pens are 50 to 250 feet long. That's all you need. So, so not, not very big at all. It depends on what, what the animal's used to, what he was raised in. What, what about the intelligence? When I think of ostriches, I think of the scene of an ostrich with his uh, head buried in the sand, and I, I, don't, I don't think of them as being too intelligent, but yet some people say they are. Uh, no, they live <laughs> totally on instinct. They're not intelligent, but they do not put their head in the sand. The babies will hide in a clump of grass, or they'll hide in a corner, and it looks like they're, they're just hiding their head, because they think if you can't see them, they can't see you. So, um... And then the big ones are grazing constantly. It looks like they are hiding ahead, so but they are not. There. No. Tell me about the industry itself. Now, you know, I was so amazed when I first found out that there was ostrich farming in the United States. Uh, it, it just seems so unreal that people would be entering this 
uh, this business? Is the industry growing at all? Is it just a few people doing it? No, the industry is growing. A few years ago, there were just two breeders in Louisiana. Today, there's 130, and that's just our state. There are birds in every state in the United States, even Canada. And the major universities are doing a lot of research and studies because South Africa does not want to share their knowledge of their number one industry. We're all learning by trial and error. Is that right? But there's a lot written now. There's a lot, lot more than when we got back into the business in 87. There's a lot more information available today. Well, why, why do people want to get into ostrich farming? They're very marketable products. You, uh, the ultimate will be a processing plant. But the meat will be the most sought after product in the future. And of course, their hides and the feathers. It's, the whole bird is marketable. You, you talk about meat. Now, I had an opportunity to get some meat from you. I had an opportunity to cook some meat and taste it. And I've got a recipe. They're not going to believe this, but I want to share a recipe for ostrich meat. But first, let's take a look at it and talk about ostrich meat for a minute. Uh, first of all, if you look at the meat, it's actually a nice, uh, dark red color. It doesn't have a lot of fat in it, so obviously it's cholesterol-free almost, right? It's right. a very lean meat. It looks just like beef. Uh, it looks like dark meat, probably of venison or some type of game, but yet a very dark beef-looking, uh, grass-fed almost uh, beef. And anything that you would do probably with uh, flank steak or round steak or whatever you could do with this, huh? Right, that's the beauty of it. It looks like beef, and it tastes like beef, and you fix it like beef, but it has less calories and very low cholesterol. Well, I'm going to do a stir fry. Why don't you get that skillet and put a little oil in it and fire it up for me, and I'm going to actually take this ostrich meat, and I know that uh, everybody's going to want to rush out and do this recipe. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start off by putting some of the meat that's already been, uh, or just kind of sliced, almost like a Chinese stir fry. I'm going to put a few pieces of the ostrich meat down into the bowl and just look at how nice and lean this meat is. It's really a beautiful meat. There's uh, no reason in the world that somebody wouldn't want to uh, uh, saute this if they're uh, looking for low fat, low cholesterol meats. I'm going to put a little pepper jelly from Nan Huff's plantation down in here. I'm going to make this a little sweetened flavor and then I'm going to put a little Louisiana hot sauce to give it that spice a little bit Worcestershire sauce, and then, of course, whatever flavorings you would want to put in a stir fry. I'm going to put, again, a little black pepper, a little salt, thyme and basil. You know, one of the things that we did when I was uh, looking for recipes, I called a couple of the ostrich growers, and they started to tell me, well, uh, we make a stroganoff, we make a sauerbrot, and we do a quick stir fry. I said, hold on, that's all beef dishes. I'm looking for ostrich dishes. It says the same thing. I was really amazed. We, we uh, charbroiled it for the commissioner of agriculture one night and didn't tell him he was eating ostrich until he was through. Right, <laughs> and, he, and he thought it was beef. Right. Okay, uh, once all of this comes together like that, I'm going to put it right down into the saute pan. I want you to stir that up for me good, Penny. And then I'm going to add some of the red, green, and golden peppers. And then I'll put a little bit of my good garlic down in there. Stir all of that around for me, uh, if you would. And I, I have to ask you uh, this one question about ostrich meat. Here we are cooking it, but is it available anywhere in the country if anybody wanted to buy ostrich meat? There is a processing plant right now in Arizona. But the ultimate goal is for three, one in Oklahoma, one in Texas, and one in Florida. But it takes an awful lot of birds to do that, approximately 250,000 per year per plant. And that's what the market is now. The industry is trying to build numbers. Now, one ostrich, uh, the prime time for slaughter would be 12 to 14 months. At that time, that bird will give you 110 to 150 pounds of meat. Hmm. A breeding pair for the summer could produce over 2,500 pounds of meat. Is that right? And you were telling me that a pair actually breeds for life. So once an ostrich comes, comes together, you're not going to break them apart. Not if you don't have to. Sometimes it doesn't work out. We do have people that try different. But it's better to raise them when they're little, unrelated pairs in an area that they're going to be comfortable in and stay in. What type of people get into ostrich farming? I know you're one of them. But what do you, what do you need if you're going to get into ostrich farming? People that love a challenge, uh, people that love animals. And it, and it is a profitable industry at this time. If somebody wanted to get into the business, 
How did he get into it? Did he did they go to the Department of Agriculture? Did yes, they call someone that's like possible. you? How, how did he get or into it? Oh, there are it? organizations. We have the Louisiana Ostrich Association. Each state has an association. The the main one being the American Ostrich Association. And they put out lists of all the breeders in your state. And also we can advertise through those means. If we uh -huh. have birds for sale, if we're looking for birds, that is how we, we do it. Now, and word of mouth is the best sale. Uh, I would imagine that the majority of the ostrich meat now, you said there was one plant, but I guess the majority of the ostrich meat now would be going to like uh, New York or Los right. Angeles where they're specially. Right. Did you tell me there was an ostrich burger restaurant on the West Coast? Yes, it was called O-Burgers. <laughs> And he did very well. It was very popular. But the, the meat was not readily available that he was hoping for, so he'll have to... I want to put just a little bit of a, uh, of a little uh, a cream right down into this. I'm going to pour that over pasta, and I tell you, it's going to make a great, great, great pasta dish. Take a look at that, and give me a little bit of that cream right there, and pour it right down into that sauce. Right down into that. We're going to make, this will almost look like a little stroganoff. Of course, it's all seasoned with all those great colors. And now I'm going to pour it right on top of the pasta. Now, doesn't this look good? Is this a dish that you do in your own home with ostrich meat? Huh? Is this one of them? Oh, boy, look at that meat. Now, I tell you, it probably would make a really good casserole, something that would take, you know, uh, an hour or so to... Uh, uh, to cook so it gets really nice and tender, but I found that the stir-fry really, really worked well. So anyway, I'm going to taste this, but I want to thank you so much for coming and sharing those great ostrich stories with us today and this recipe, and I'm going to come back and play with that little bitty baby. But I want you all to come back, too, and visit as we continue to cook up more of these great taste of Louisiana. So we'll see you later. <laughs> Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $22.95. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Fulce features recipes and food history behind Louisiana's cuisine. This 352-page cookbook contains over 250 recipes, including those from this show. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.